Hey art nerds, last time on Watercolor Crash Course, I demonstrated many different watercolor techniques and showed you guys how to simply paint a field of wildflowers. Today, we're gonna take those techniques and also add in some color mixing, color handling, and water handling, and I'm going to demonstrate how I go, go about painting a watercolor illustration from start to finish. So, grab your paints, grab your brushes, and let's get painting. There, art nerds, welcome to the last pre-recorded installment of the Watercolor Crash Course series. All we have left is our troubleshooting live stream, and I'll let you guys know when you can expect that, so make sure you have your questions ready. What we're going to do today is I have here a inked illustration. It was inked onto Stonehenge Aqua watercolor paper, so it's a cotton rag watercolor paper using a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. And this is an illustration from Lilliputian Living, my yearly inked October challenge. So I come up with a prompt, I come up with an illustration generally based around the Lilliputian world, and then I do a little bit of world building. And this is from 2021's Lilliputian Living. So this is volume one. This contains the first four years of Lilliputian Living. This is going to go into volume two when volume two is complete. And Lilliputian Living is inspired by my work on my long form watercolor comic, Seven Inch Kara, which you can read for free at sevenincharacom or you can get your own lovely full color watercolor copy at natosoup.com slash natosoup. So what I'm going to do today is I am going to really focus on the color mixing and the water handling and that sort of thing. So I have a secondary camera off screen. I have these risers that I'm going to go ahead and put underneath. That's going to prop it up a few inches so that gravity can be our friend, help us out a bit. I have my watercolor palette. This is my daily driver watercolor palette. So this is the palette I use all the time, including when painting Kara. It's just a collection of some of my favorite watercolor paints. Give it a quick spritz with water to pre-activate it. And what we're going to be focusing on is water handling, color mixing, that sort of thing. So we're going to have a two camera setup. We're going to have the main camera where you can actually see the painting. And then we're going to have a secondary camera where hopefully you can see the palette you can see the water, you can see how I handle the brushes, and hopefully that'll answer some of the questions that might be starting to come up, because I'm getting a lot of questions about how to handle water and how to mix paints, and I figured this might allow us to uh, kind of not skip that, but answer some of those questions a little bit more organically. So usually I don't include the color, like the palette part of a step-by-step -step thing, because it means I have to pull way out and it's harder to see. But this is a smaller illustration, so it's not going to take up as much space on the desk. And hopefully I'll be able to get it all in here. So if you guys have any questions about watercolor that weren't answered by the other segments of the Watercolor Crash Course series, I would love it if you'd send them to me either through Discord or in the comments. Or join me for the troubleshooting live stream where hopefully I can answer some of your questions. So I am painting today with silver black velvet watercolor brushes. I have a ceramic watercolor palette. I may end up grabbing another. I'm going to grab a cup of clean filtered water because I live in Southeast Louisiana and we have a lot of minerals in our water. So using filtered water helps eliminate some of the problems that minerals in the water can cause. And we're gonna get to painting. So this painting is going to be done in time lapse because frankly, no one wants to sit around for six hours. But hopefully you guys will get the gist and hopefully between the two cameras, your questions will be answered. So I'm gonna start with a toning wash first. That's gonna kinda of give the character a place on the paper and make it seem less like it's just stark white paper. And I'm utilizing the well in my ceramic palette to hold the water and the paint for that mix. So the thing about watercolor is there's a reason the water comes first. Your mixes are gonna be primarily water with a little bit of pigment. This is one of the reasons I prefer to work from dried half pans is it allows me to control the amount of pigment I'm applying to the page 
stage and kind of build it up gradually over time. So for her skin tone, I mixed some yellow ochre and a little bit of scarlet. I have a big old tutorial on mixing skin tones for more comic-esque art like my art that I'm going to link for you guys down in the description below. If you're curious, there are significant differences between how someone like me who paints for comics and paints more cartoony illustrations, handles watercolor versus how someone who's more of a realist or even a portrait painter handles watercolor. So if you're interested in realism and portraits, you might want to check out some of the other amazing artists here on YouTube, like Mind of Watercolor, James Gurney, or The Frugal Crafter. So I am applying a really light wash of ultramarine blue for her dress. And I'm kind of drawing that last bead of water that you can kind of see at the almost at the edge of her dress down for the next layer. I'm painting on Stonehenge Aqua watercolor paper. This is a cold pressed cotton rag watercolor paper that can hold a lot of water. That not only means I can apply a lot of water to the paper and it'll hold on to it, but also that it stays open for a long time and it allows me to blend and rework it for a long time. So I work with about five different cotton rag watercolor papers, uh, Stonehenge Aqua being one of the more affordable ones in that lineup, but I also work with Blick Studio watercolor paper. If you watch my unboxing swatches, you'll recognize that. It's affordable and I find it is almost comparable to Arches and how it handles. I also do use Arches from time to time as well as Canson's Moulin de Roy. And then for cellulose papers, which I don't necessarily recommend, but I do use them and I'll get into that more a little bit. I use Canson's uh, Montval, sorry, I use Canson Montval for Kara pages and I used to use Canson XL, but I find that their quality's really gone down. So I kind of avoid it at this point. So what I'm doing right now is I'm kind of creating my initial color washes. I'm blocking in my color. So you guys see me utilizing my ceramic daisy palette to kind of create these larger mixes of water. And I basically start by applying some water into the well palette, whether it's by dripping it from my brush or by pouring it from the cup, or you can use an eyedropper if you have one handy, and then mixing my color into that. And since it's a white palette, it really kind of reflects the color that I'm going to be applying to the page well. So I get a pretty good idea once I've started mixing it, what the colors are actually going to look like. If you look at the top of my Daily Driver palette, you'll see a swatch sheet. So the thing about watercolor is with high quality watercolors, the mass tone, that is the color of the watercolor in a pile, like in a half pan, is often different, not always, but often, it's different from how the color actually swatches in terms of intensity, in terms of darkness. So to be able to find your colors, making a swatch sheet like this is really helpful. It's also really helpful in color selection. And I recommend making your swatch sheet on the same type of paper. This is a scrap of cotton rag that has seen a lot of abuse over the years. So if you primarily paint on cellulose, do it on cellulose. If you primarily paint on cotton rag, do it on cotton rag. And you guys will also notice that I build up my layers very thinly over time. I work, it, um, to steal a phrase from oil painting, I work fat over lean. So that means that I apply really thin layers that are mostly water, which is a little bit of color. And I build that up for quite some time to build up our intensity and to build up our saturation and to also start building in some shadow colors or maybe some highlights. And then as we near the end of the painting and my colors are mostly adjusted, I'm working in with thicker, more saturated layers of paint, paint that has more pig pigment in the wash. Um, and one of the reasons to do, there's a lot of reasons to do that, but one of the reasons to do that is it helps prevent the painting from becoming muddy. Um, I also recommend that you don't start working on details too early in. You kind of work on the broad strokes and filling everything in and figuring out where your colors are going to be before you start like really honing in and refining a certain area. The only exception to that would be I do a lot of these kind of like botanical illustrations with like my character Kara and like leaves and stuff. Sometimes I'll work the leaves quite a bit because I know that's going to influence the colors that I choose for her clothing and maybe how I tone her. So those kind of instances where you have a lot of environmental influence on the characters from the background, you might want to work the background quite a bit to really help you decide what you want to do with the characters and help them feel like they're actually placed in the background. But an illustration like this one is pretty simple and straightforward. I'm just using kind of um, from the upper right lighting. So her, our right lighting 
and I'm not really doing a lot of atmospheric effects. I'm not really doing a lot of harsh lighting. I'm keeping it pretty simple, not only because this illustration is just kind of joyful and straightforward, and I don't want to overwork that, but also just to kind of keep it simple for you guys who are painting along at home or are watching this to answer some of your watercolor questions. So in general, my method for handling watercolor is pretty straightforward, whether I'm working on Kara pages or I'm working on a standalone illustration like this. I just build up thin layers, one on top of the other, adding in additional color and adjusting color as I go. And I know that sounds like such a cop-out answer, but that's really what it is. It's just a lot of layers and a lot of patience. So I live in Southeast Louisiana where it's pretty humid. Fortunately, we do have air conditioning and fans and that can help with dry times quite a bit. But if you're struggling with dry times and you don't have air conditioning, you can try putting it beneath a fan or a vent. You can try buying a de humidifier, although I hesitate to recommend that because it wrecked my skin and almost killed basil. So that might not be a good fit for you if you have pets or sensitive skin. Or you can try using a hair dryer, or you can just accept that good things take time and be a little bit more patient. Maybe utilize this as a bathroom break or a chance to go get a snack or a chance to go get some water or to do some chores or to work on another task. That's generally what I do with these is I allow them to help me pace myself so that I don't work myself too much into a rut. So one of the big questions I get asked regarding watercolor is water control and that's something that I think a lot of people struggle with and there are two areas you can kind of focus on that will help you with your water control but I also utilize some outside techniques as well so first of all the paper you're painting on if you're painting on a cellulose paper your water is not going to soak into the surface of your paper the way it would a cotton rag paper it's just going to sit on the surface so water control is always going to be something you're kind of fighting with if you're painting on cellulose papers now I paint seven inch Kara on a set cellulose paper. There are sometimes cellulose papers that have properties that you want, whether it's the price point or the way you can run it through a printer or what have you. So I'm not entirely dismissing cellulose paper out of hand, but if you really want to try something different and troubleshooting, troubleshoot your watercolor experience, trying out a cold pressed cotton rag watercolor paper might be a good way to see if that eliminates some of your water control issues. Painting in very humid areas can also cause water control issues because since it's so humid in the air, even if you're painting on a cotton rag paper, the water may just sit for hours in the paper or may just drip drop off your brush. So getting some kind of air movement, whether it's a fan or opening some windows or turning on the AC, just something may also help with water control. And then finally, the brush that you're using can make a big difference. I have found that synthetic brushes do not work well for for me with water control. They're too stiff and the bristles are too straight. They don't really hold on to water very well and they don't have a belly the way mixed fiber brushes and natural hair brushes do. So natural hair brushes have these little flags on the individual hairs and that helps hold on to water. So that's why natural hair brushes and mixed fiber brushes can be a great way to address some of your fiber, um, your water control issues. That said, they can be much more expensive than synthetic brushes. And there are a lot of people who have kind of ethical concerns about the hairs, which I totally understand. And they also just require some additional upkeep. You can't beat them up quite the way you can with synthetic brushes. So it's a personal choice thing, but if you're struggling with water control and it's your brush drip dropping all over the place, try a natural hairbrush. And Sumi hairbrushes can be an affordable way to try natural hairbrushes without spending a fortune. Also, hopefully you guys noticed this, but I will kind of like squeegee my brush against the side of my watercolor palette quite a bit to remove excess water. And I will also dab it off on a paper towel that isn't in the shot because it's blocked, but you can kind of see it underneath the secondary camera view. It's covered in color. That's because I'll just dab off just a little bit some of the excess water and pigment that's on the brush just to help with water control. If I'm coloring a large area and I want it to be kind of seamless, I won't do that. But if it's a humid day and I'm trying to do some fine details, I will do that. Especially since the silver black velvet smaller brushes 
tend to have just a lot of control issues compared to their larger brushes. So on that note, I am painting with a mixed fiber brush today. I'm actually using several of them. I'm using the silver black velvet watercolor brushes. I happen to really like these brushes. I have good experiences with them. I've tried synthetic, I've tried a variety of synthetics. I've tried Kalinsky Sable, I've tried Squirrel. And what I like about the silver black velvet brushes is that they last much longer than I found my natural hair brushes to last because the surface texture of a cold press watercolor page can kind of degrade your natural hair brushes over time, kind of like if you are sandpapering them. And the mixed fiber just holds up better to the nature of the paper than many of the natural hair brushes that I've had. So when I'm handling watercolor, I like to work from dried out half pans. These were filled from tubes and allowed to dry and they just kind of contain a myriad of different watercolor brands that I like. All of them I believe are professional grade and it's just stuff that I found that I liked over the years. I don't have like one brand that really stands out to me as a particular favorite. There's individual colors that I just love from different brands. And this was amassed over a decade. So I started with a 12 color cotton set because yes, Technically, you can mix any color you need using a basic 12 color set. The Cotman set is not a good <laughs> mixing set for that. I ended up making a lot of mud over the years. But as I progressed and as I grew and as I slowly collected my dragon's horde of watercolors and I reviewed watercolors and talked to you about watercolors, I found other colors that I liked. I found other brands that I liked. And as a watercolor comic artist, you guys might notice I have a bunch of colors in there. Many of them are convenience colors. That's pre-mixed colors. And that just allows me to paint a little faster because I'm not mixing my most commonly used colors over and over and over again. They're ready for me. Now, I do mix many of my colors. That's why you guys see the palette over the side. And I do utilize both atomic and optical mixing to generate different colors because how you handle the paints, how you layer them, whether you mash them together in a palette or you layer them on, one, on top of one another on the page can make a big difference. And the only way you can figure out what you like and what works for your art is to just paint a lot to practice, to practice from reference, to practice from photos, to practice from your own illustrations until you kind of hit something that you like. So this illustration has dried overnight. I have some ideas for how I want to adjust it. And yes, it is thundering outside. So that should make watercoloring today interesting. So my watercolors have actually dried out in the ceramic palette. That's fine. That's not a problem. Actually, that can be good at this stage because it allows us to create more saturated colors very easily without having to remix too much. So my focus is today. In fact, I made some critique notes on what I'd like to change and improve and add as this piece goes on. And this is a pretty helpful thing for these. Well, when I'm doing a longer piece, these are really helpful because at the end of the evening, I can sit and take notes for what I want to fix the next day. And that way I feel like I can go to sleep without worrying about whether I'm going to remember to fix them. So one of the things I definitely want to do is I want to lift out. So this is ultramarine blue for the most part, and that's going to be pretty lifting. I want to go in and lift out some highlights, and then we can get going on the rest of the watercolor painting. 
So these have been time-lapsed about 8x, and that's because no one wants to sit around for six hours and watch me paint a watercolor illustration. I also did not include any of the dry time because literally no one wants to sit around and watch paint dry. But one of the other problems I noticed that people have with watercolor is they're just not patient enough with themselves and with the medium. Good things take time. When you're working with digital art, you have the option to work very immediately, one layer after the other, and it's not gonna have a negative impact. Impact. With traditional media, including alcohol markers, that's not the case. Time is actually a tool, much like the materials that you're using and the paper that you're working on. Whether you wait for the paint to dry to apply another layer and glaze your next layer on, or you apply it while it's still wet and the colors diffuse into one another. Those are options. A lot of people see it as kind of a downside. They wonder how somebody like me can stand to paint hundreds of comic pages. I mean, I have ADHD and I'm incredibly impatient. But I find that watercolor is very immediate and very satisfying in a way that there are a lot of mediums that just don't do that for me. Digital art just doesn't do that for me. So it's really about if you think watercolor is for you, finding a way to love the process. And I love the watercolor process. I love working with my hands. I love working with the paints. I love the granulation. I love the way they layer. I love the way they handle. If you can't find kind of zen and happiness in watercolor, then you may want to try just recreating it digitally or trying a different medium. You don't have to be great at every medium and if it's something you don't enjoy and it just frustrates you, then it's okay to move on and maybe come back to it another time. That doesn't make you less of an artist. So to circle back just a little bit, I wanna talk about paints, papers, and brushes. When I first started working on 7-inch Kara, I didn't really know much about anything and I wasn't getting a lot of guidance, at least when it came to watercolor. I bought the cheapest paper. I bought Canson's student grade 90 pound cellulose watercolor paper, which was terrible. I bought a 12 color set of Cotman because I thought surely that would be plenty. And I bought a bunch of inexpensive synthetic brushes. And I got this from the local Dicklet because I was living in Savannah, Georgia. And the first chapter is just, it's fine. It's fine, you can read it, it's still up. You can check it out. In fact, you probably ought to but it was definitely a learning experience and I kept butting my head up against problems and having to learn how to fix them. And fortunately, I had friends and a professor who were great at watercolor that I could bring my problems to and bring my questions to. But the thing is, if you want to watercolor and you've never painted before, the only advice somebody can really give you is what materials to start with and some general broad strokes. The best way to get started is to get started and then come with specific questions because then people can help you with specific solutions. So by diving into watercolor and forcing myself to make mistakes and allowing myself to make mistakes and getting frustrated and having to problem solve and trying out different things, not only did it inspire me and give me this love of like trying and experimenting and possibly failing, but it also made me wanna record what I was doing so that if I could help other people, then that material is out there. And that kind of was the crux of the Natto Soup Studio blog. So nattosoup.blogspot.com for like seven years. And that's still a big crux of what I do here. So I wanted to kind of create a mask. So I'm just using a cheap sheet of printer paper that's been torn. And the only reason I'm really creating a mask is so that I don't get any stray dots like on her face or on top of her eye or just some other inopportune place. Now you could use Frisket for that if you really wanted to, but Frisket is very adhesive of it leaves a nasty residue and it does not like water very well so it like doubles down on leaving that nasty residue so way back when I decided for chapter two to switch to a slightly more expensive paper so I went from 90 grade 90 pound sorry Canson student to 180 pound Canson Montval and that's what I still paint Kara on because it works well for the project. It works well for the comic pages. Cotton rag paper is wonderful, but teeny tiny illustrations like what I'm doing when I'm painting comic page, not so great. Also, cotton rag paper can hold a lot of layers, which would encourage me to kind of overpaint my comic pages, which is actually something I'm trying to work away from. I also upgraded my paints over the years, moving from student grade to professional grade. And I also experimented with a bunch of different brushes. I tried a bunch of different brands and I slowly amassed a collection of watercolor brushes that I really like. 
and that I can rely on and that perform consistently without getting totally beaten up. So that's why I can make a lot of the recommendations that I make to you guys. It's a decade of painting hundreds of comic pages and illustrations has given me a lot of experience. So you guys can see over the course of about 30 minutes, I've started to really build up the layers. And it's just a lot of patience working back and forth, slowly building things up and slowly adding more layers until it's the, the saturation that you like. I am just about finished with this, but I do have some finishing touches to do. So next I'm going to pull out my watercolor pencils and use those sparingly because I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. And then I'm going to pull out my white gouache and add some highlights. So I'm removing the risers that I had propping it up. And I also remove the bulldog clips so that it can lie mostly flat. It's a little bit bowed, so it might want to rock on me. Sorry about that noise, that's my computer. I'm also gonna go ahead and remove my palette, or at least move it off to the side. I'm not gonna clean it yet because I may find that I need to go back into it. But I'm going to move these things just to make some room for my watercolor pencils. So my personal recommendations for working with watercolor pencils, I tend to save them for the final details to add some rim lighting or to add a little shadow or to just slightly adjust the color of something. I also like to work with them when the paper is dry. You can work with them when the paper is wet and get a different effect, but I find that they cut into the paper and they just don't work the way I want them to. I also find it helpful to blend them out with a little bit of clean water just to kind of soften those transitions so they're not super noticeable. Our illustration is dry, it is finished, and all that's left is to remove it from the blue tape. So I am going to carefully peel it away because I overlapped it on the back and it's been on the stretcher board for a while. So usually if these sit too long, they don't come up as easy. Pulling away. I have heard that using a hair dryer will make it release a little bit easier. So if you have a hair dryer, that is something you can do. I don't believe I do. So I am just pulling away at a 90 degree angle. So if it does tear, it doesn't actually tear into the illustration itself. And I'll get that later. So hopefully that second camera made it a little bit easier to see how I handle paint and to see how I handle water control. I use generally the silver black velvet watercolor brushes, which are kind of the best of both worlds of a synthetic brush and a natural squirrel hair brush. And they don't have the water control issues that a lot of synthetics have. So that's why I prefer them. They're not as drippy. They can hold more water. If you are painting at home, of course, I recommend you use two cups, one for your clean water, one for your dirty water. But if you're like me and you don't have quite enough space for that, especially if there's a second camera involved, 
then just one cup and change the water out frequently. And then I put what's known as a paint puck, which is like a silicone scrubber in the bottom of my water cup. And that helps get my brushes clean as well. So we have finished it. And that almost brings us to the end of the watercolor crash course. All that's really left is for us to do the troubleshooting Q&A, which I'm looking forward to. I hope you guys are looking forward to it. So if you still have any questions or you just want to hang out and see some different techniques and different ways of handling paint, please feel free to drop on by. You can find out information about when that live stream is going to be over on my community tab. One more thing, just in terms of talking about how I handle the paint. I prefer to work with half pans or whole pans, basically dried paint. And I usually refill my pans using a tube of watercolor. So each tube can give me anywhere between three to five refills. What I like about that is it's very compact. It's very easy. And for me, it results in less waste than if I were working with wet paint directly. But you work however you are comfortable with and whatever methods work well for you. That just works well for me as somebody with a pet cat and has cat hair everywhere being able to shut my palette is pretty dang helpful so hopefully this was helpful useful and informative for you guys if you enjoyed today's watercolor crash course please be sure to let me know down in the comments below or share this or any other video any other tutorial review walkthrough what have you that I've shared here on the channel with somebody you think it might help that is a great way to support the work that I'm doing over here. Help me spread the word and help more people make art a habit. So this Froggy Free Spirit was originally from the second volume. So the volume I'm currently working on of Lilliputian Living. If you like my art and illustration and you'd like some of your own, you can order your own copy of the first volume in the Natto Shop. I'll have a link down in the description below for you guys. This work this ongoing illustration and prompt series was inspired by my work on seven inch kara a charming watercolor comic about a seven inch tall lilliputian girl named kara who discovers a massive family secret and sets out to find adventure and friendship in southeast louisiana this is my baby this is what has inspired all of my watercolor work and reviews here on the channel over the years my passion for watercolor comes from my passion for comics and watercolor comics so if you enjoy my art if you enjoy my work and you'd like to check out my comic you can find it listed in the natto shop as well or you can read the first eight chapters for free at sevenincharacter.com So today we used two cameras to demonstrate not only how to paint a watercolor illustration, but also how I go about handling the paint and handling the water since water control and paint control are two of the biggest questions I get when it comes to handling watercolor. So if you guys have any further questions, make sure you join me for our troubleshooting live stream. I'm going to announce it on the community tab. I'll probably do a short announcing it. And I will also announce it on my Discord server, The Paint Box, as well as on Facebook, Patreon, and Twitter. So hopefully social media won't ha hide it. So keep an eye out for that. And if you guys have any questions that I haven't been able to answer for you guys in this crash course, make sure you have them ready because I am prepared to demonstrate and answer your questions. And I'm really looking forward to hanging out with you guys and doing just that. I hope you guys enjoyed today. Hopefully seeing how I handle the paints was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. But you guys can also see why that is often an element of watercolor illustration that I cut out of the videos. Um, you only, only need to see that so many times. So hopefully we've hit it one and done and we've got it. So if you guys have any questions that aren't like troubleshooting questions, you can let me know down in the comments below. Make sure you check the description because I'll have some links to other great watercolor tutorials as well as other videos in our watercolor crash course series, as well as links to the Discord server and other ways you can check out my art or get a hold of me. And if you enjoy my art and you'd like to see more of it, a great way to do that is to check out my watercolor web comics 7-inch Kara. You can learn a little bit more about it here. 
Seven Inch Kara is an ongoing graphic novel series about a seven inch tall Lilliputian girl named Kara who's been sheltered her entire life. She finds out a huge family secret and sets out to find out the truth about humans and friendship. You can read Seven Inch Kara at sevenincharacom as a webcomic or you can order volume one or volume two or both volume one and volume two through the Natto shop at natosoup.com slash shop. So series like this one are only made possible thanks to the support of my amazing patrons on Patreon as well as the support of my husband. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to help me continue to do what I do, making art accessible to a wide variety of people, you can join me at patreon.com slash natosoup. And not only will you get early access to stuff like this today, but you'll also get printables as well as materials that I generate for my in-person classes. So that could be a great way to affordably access things that otherwise would just not be available if you live outside of Louisiana. I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. Hopefully this last installment of the watercolor crash course is helpful in inspiring you guys to make art a habit. And if you're looking for more great watercolor while you wait for our troubleshooting live stream, you should definitely check out my Stash Buster tutorial series where I show you guys how to make bookmarks using scraps from your watercolor stash. Very easy tutorials, very technique based. So even if you're not confident in your art skills and your drawing skills, you can still paint along with me. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Bye guys!